So, um, yeah, thanks yeah. for the, hosting this. I have been working for the past couple of years with my colleagues at the University of North Texas, uh, computational linguists and information science uh, professionals, uh, uh, professors in those two departments, as well as our own linguistic computational linguists. And so some of the things we've been looking at are my own flex projects uh, for Mete and for uh, Lam Kang and kind of uh, trying to think about how to bring them up to a level where uh, as we add more languages that we would be able to do comparison between them uh, faster and then facilitate um, better descriptions of those languages themselves and also newer languages that we can add in where a lot hasn't been described yet but with some um, connected text we could speed up annotation and know where the differences are. So in thinking about that, um, we started thinking about the importance of kind of standardizing our not necessarily annotation, or, but at least having a um, thoughtful process in how our interlinear gloss texts are created. And this has been done many times before. Uh, but it's been done from a really uh, higher level. Like for all of linguistics, we would like to create standardized annotation schemes. So NSF has funded things of that nature. And they've always sort of crashed because, not totally, but they haven't taken on because um, communities of users uh, have their own ways of doing things. And within those communities, individuals have their own way of doing things. And so I thought it would be really useful to start from like a, a smaller group of people. and so. I, why not start with us? If we have only 50 languages and only a handful of, of researchers, why not look at our IGT and see what we can do with um, trying to uh, standardize some of those processes? So I had uh, some of my students work with me, specifically Mary Burke, who's a PhD student at UNT in the information science uh, program, Concentration in Linguistics. And she, uh, we did sort of a survey of uh, several of the um, already published um, grammars and descriptions of um, South Central languages that are existing, and we tried to see what the similarities and differences were for some of the major uh, grammatical constructions that, you know, we see them repeated over and over. David just covered several of them already. But we know that um, IGT is useful both in the analysis stage and in the presentation stage. So in the analysis stage, we use it right from the get-go. We record things. And now with um, types of software that are present, like Flex and Elon, we're able to first um, use programs to do quick transcription. I use Seymour these days more and more because I can train uh, speakers to use it with me, and then we get time-aligned transcriptions that we can then either throw into Elon or throw into Flex. And I mention this because these software packages often constrict or guide the way we're annotating things. So um, we use it for those. And, and as we're parsing, uh, the programs help us keep track of what we're doing and help us kind of look back and see what we've done before and improve our, our parses. Uh, but they also are restrictive of how much we can move things around. We have to make certain decisions based on dashes and equal signs, um, which are the kind of the basic units of divisions that they allow us. So we can do prefixes, suffixes, we can do enclitics, and there's a way of also noting um, uh, circumfixes. So we can do dashes to do that, dot, 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 you know, the parentheses to do that. Okay, so um, each of these things seem to feed into the other. We have free translations that help us with the word glosses and so on. So the interlinear gloss text, even at the very beginning, helps us with analysis. And we're making decisions as we go along. And that's a really um, crucial thing to remember that in these software packages, they don't help us save, I would say, 50% of the decision making that we're doing. Like, what are the constituents? Where does the noun phrase begin and end? Which is the auxiliary? And it doesn't help us save a lot of that because of the way that they're made. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So at the end, we might end up with something like this with these different lines of glossing. Some people have fewer, some people have less. But it'll be uh, familiar to you what this, what this looks like. Um, so each of these pieces holds a lot of grammatical information. And we'd like to see that as we're working in Cookie Chin that we're, we have some similar sorts of reflections of those analysis that come out of these 
uh, decisions that we make. Um, I know you, you've probably already looked at a flex before, but I wanted to point out that the way we spell things and the way we um, gloss things, we can use the concordance program to really help us with the analysis. We can use the lexicon to go back and check on what we're doing, make sure we have standardized kind of spelling. So anyway, that's the whole analysis stage. IGT is great for that. We've also talked, I think, in the field about how using both experimental data and connected text data is important. So there are all these reasons why we want to encourage people to be collecting uh, interlinear gloss text. Um, then in the presentation stage, we're right now looking at how having kind of a good IGT can help with creating pedagogical materials. And so uh, if you have something which is very detailed, um, and so let me just show you an example of that. For example, I've got this very short story, which you all must have something like this in your collections. So it's very it's repetitive. So you have the third person uh, past uh, repeated and very short constructions, like the cockroach was eaten up by a chicken, the chicken was eaten up by an eagle, the eagle rested on a tree. Repetitive kinds of simple sentences that can then be pulled out and put into children's books or into teaching materials easily. You can also use the interlinear glosses for more detailed kind of grammatical inspection. So um, I was just talking to Linda about this yesterday that how can, how can we speed up creation of pedagogical materials? So if we can have a more standardized way of doing our IGTs, then perhaps we can build sort of templates for going to these uh, collections and saying, here are some lesson plans based on your interlinear gloss corpus. So if we have the same kind of lines of um, analysis, we could, we could then maybe use that for pedagogical material creation as well. So um, what I wanted to just do with you, because I was told half an hour, so I've got only about half an hour's worth of material here, so we're going to look at how we have made these kinds of decisions in the, in the things that have already been published in terms of whether an item is an affix, stem root, or clitic. Is it clear? How have we made those decisions? Um, what are the implications of the ways that we've put compounds down in our IGT, reduplication, and so on? So let's take a look first at something we just talked about, semantic change or grammaticalization. So in Lam Kang, for example, you can have, um, as you see on the left-hand side, you can have these things like Jung and um, Hung and Hung as main verbs. So you can also have them, as you see on the right-hand side, as um, prefixes. And so I am indicating this with this conventional distinction of either writing something in lower caps and giving it a, saying this is a lexeme versus in um, all caps saying this is actually a grammaticalized uh, a piece of the grammar. So um, this is something that immediately then sets this apart from, from its uh, role as a, as a lexeme and reduces the amount of freedom that it has in constructions of what kinds of NPs it can take and grammatical structure and so on. It's really just a bound morpheme. We see this as something that should be standard, but actually it is not, and it's quite different in different things. So here is um, an example from live from, this is not really fair to Ken Van Bick because it was an unpublished uh, handout that he used in, the, in Dartmouth uh, when we came in to do grammar overview there. So um, in, in his analysis or what his presentation suggests is that come and down here are both sort of on an equal footing um, and that they are um, one is not a prefix but it's supposed to, it maybe it's supposed to be a compound or maybe it's a sequence of, of serial verbs or there's some some grammar that's reflected in the way that that this is glossed and so we would like to perhaps then in our uh, code book of how to do IGT, directional verbs and the way that we're going to talk about them should be standardized or could be easily standardized, I think, with just a little bit of discussion of uh, where we'd want to use our caps and where we'd want to use the lower forms. Um, let's see, how about this one? Um, same here, right? Oh, here we do have adverb, adverb dot directional. Um, did I make a... 
plus for Tika is missing. Ah, uh, that's what it is. Okay, so go down. So the Advtir is... It should be somewhere right here. Is the Hun part. Ah. Uh -huh. And Go is... We have... The, sh the Go should be right here. Uh, the Go is the Kal part. And so if you... Uh -huh. um, okay. Tika is a separate... So we have a yeah. separated form. Tika is the down part. No, that's the one. Oh, okay. Color um, Okay, let's look a little bit at reduplication now, of which there is a lot of variety and variation in the way that we represent these things. I just put up the Lamkang verbal complex because I know that many of us have seen something similar of this sort. And uh, for Lamkang, you can find right here in zone six. Um, reduplicated forms that are acting as kind of, um, uh, you know, adverbial intensifiers, but the verb root itself can also be duplicated. And uh, so let's take a look at how that looks. So this one is put 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 put, which means uh, kissing someone. So uh, so repeatedly kissing, you would say put 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 put. And but it has the uh, um, participant markers here. Oh, this is actually just the cheek that's being kissed, right? So put 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 put, and then you have you have a, um, a kind of um, the uh, inflection coming right to the end of it. So the way that we've selected to show that this is different is by using this M dash. But in most of the cases that we've seen, um, we have to do this manually after we pull it out of the program. We can't use this inflex, so we can only use a regular dash, which immediately is not giving what we want. You know, that's not. This is really one form. So I know that uh, Zachariah, for example, you selected and I think um, you as well to just write things of the sort together as one form. So that's one thing that we could also do. Look at this um, reduplicated form in, in Lam Kang. So you get Advan Thi, Advan Thi In. So you've got a very large chunk of it that's zone one, zone, uh, zone two, and oh, this is actually the main verb, the Van, and then, oh, sorry, Thi is the main verb. So you've got zone two, you've got the verb root, all of that copied, and then um, seven, zone seven at the end. So we want to show that this is um, not a compound, but a reduplicated form, and we need to find a way to figure out how to do that. So that's, that's that. Um, and here's the one where I was showing how zone six is copied. So you've got Chen, and then Dok Dok Dao, um, and Sek Sek Ra. So there, it's, it's right in the middle, and again, we're trying to use that M dash to show how that happens. So, okay, here's how it's done in Miso. And you'll see, this is unfair in a sense that these are really legacy materials. These were done in the 1980s, and so we don't expect them to have the same sort of sophistication in the glossing paradigms because they were done with typewriter or whatever. So there are going to be differences there, but it's very interesting to see how, what are all the choices that could possibly happen. So uh, uh, very, very. So I would like to point out a couple of additional things on this one, which is gloss exactly according to meaning, gloss in a more um, abstract way as in intensity, intensity, as you see on the right-hand side. Um, and then here, of course, is a completely different type of form, very much like the put, 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 asur, asur. So we've got um, uh, just write them separately in this, in this case. There's that miso. In Dai Chin, um, we find here, Yet another way of doing it where it says uh, you have intensifier and then vary, which is giving us sort of a meaning for what the first one is and what the second part means. There is a dash on the baseline, but in the gloss line, you've got a colon giving you the meaning for the whole thing. So this is one possibility where we could say what the super category is and then what the meaning might be. So, but we don't have that standardized yet. We're still kind of playing with that. Um, in Kumi, uh, we've got then what you had called the um, verb classifier. So the whole thing is written together as one, and then the whole thing is just called a verb classifier. The meaning of it is not given as we had in Dai Chin, so that would be something that you'd want to get from the gloss, I guess, from the free translation. It's, it's not uh, sort of... Yeah. The meaning there is big. What? The meaning there is big. <laughs> the meaning it's is big, big. right, right. <laughs> But um, I would probably find many things then glossed as verbal classifier, augmentative verbal classifier, and they wouldn't just all be foo foo. There may be others that are like that too, right? So, and they would all mean big. 
they would all maybe basically so in a way you could have known as the most elements or large, right? or, I mean in a funny yeah. way but kind of yeah I mean just, on, on VCL is an open class I mean it's not a you know, it's yeah. you know, hundreds of elements so and they would all have pretty much the same meaning of but well, fun, all, phonologically the ones that are on VCL all have the central sense of largeness of a participant but mm -hmm. uh, they might have some additional lexical so the choice would, and that would be a perfectly reasonable choice to say that this is what we want to do. And is it possible for us to see more of a general use of it in the other languages of the family? Would be, it would be useful to do that. So in Kiao, we see similarly things written as one form, um, and so in the glittering leaf part, for example, you have yao yao, and then you have the ah, which may be a separate morpheme there, but yeah, so it's written, and then um, yeah, pong pong ah, but here they're written. Um, yeah. So the book in the in the Feng Feng what does the book mean? Is that the, the in part? Or that's the white part. Yeah, white. Yeah. Okay. So Feng Feng Ah. Um, okay. And then you have similar to our Pot Pot, uh, the kissing one. You've got Kong Kong Pei Kong Pei, but this may be more of a, is it a more of a like a serial or a a sequen sequence of actions or kept doing it more aspectual? Yeah, kind of. yeah. So it's slightly different in meaning. So. Perhaps when we have these differences in usages, we also want differences in the way that we're going to it. in South Asia, like going, 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 going. Right. Like something is like something like that. So, doing, doing, thing and good. Yeah, so there would definitely be. Um, um, and then in uh, the some uh, in Analaga, we see something like a. Um, the main verb and the, the verb and then the copied form called reduplicated form. So that. So what is that? Uh, do you recognize this? From, it's from, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what the function is or? I don't yeah, it seemed like. Um, Maybe, yeah, also in transportation, much. right? Do not at all. Uh, but I don't do not keep doing do it or do not keep sleeping. I really don't. Know. Is it, is it, is it <laughs> We're turning to you and it's like, yes, I don't know. Yes, yes, so I, I am not my brother's so keeper. In, in Sydney, I give that talk about uh, verb, not verb, meaning intensive verb. Uh, and that looks like that. Actually. Oh, with the not on the. Yeah. But then uh, this like is. Copy lost I mean, it really don't yeah. sleep. I mean, it's similar, but it's not the same. It doesn't have the same yeah. function. It's just intensification. Uh -huh. But it's oh, verb, that's what verb. You, that's what you said many more. Yeah, verb, bad verb. Yeah. That, that looks like it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's an imperative. Yeah. All right. Um, so I feel like this should be fairly easy to do by just gathering all our examples and figuring out like exactly how we want to do this and then giving uh, a guide to those who are new uh, researchers who are do, just starting out on IGT, and I want to just talk about that briefly when we get to the end of the presentation. Then stem alternation, similarly, there are a variety of different ways in which we're indicating those. So we have two, uh, the Roman numeral. Um, uh, old school here, we have B, and then we also ha have uh, don't mark the A, so or have a set that just don't have any marking on it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe those that have no variant uh, shown, you may not mark that. It's really hard because sometimes, yeah, some sometimes a lot of them don't have it, mm -hmm. and sometimes they might have it, but you just don't have it in your data set. <laughs> you don't know, you know whether it's a probably, glottal stop. They probably have it, have it, but you don't. You don't know what it is. It may be a tone, or yeah, yeah. people are not able to. So, um, so what do you do with those, right? Uh, we have Arabic numerals, and for the meso, um, and then we do have the three here, which I believe is for uh, those where. Uh, there is no variant, so that it shows with a three. But where sometimes you, there's also three forms. Yeah, yeah. Yes. just put them, yeah. give them, a, just give them something. Positive there's some that have three forms, right? Yeah. With the aspirate or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so that should be, again, fairly easy for us to figure out what to do with. And then when we say we don't know, can we mark that? Or what should we do with those? Or do we well, just mark them unmarked? have a default of not marking, and then if you know, you mark it. Otherwise, you, you know. Okay. Otherwise, you, I, I think as a... If you if you you know you have the data set that you have, and if you don't know, you don't know. And if you're being made to feel that every item is defective, that's that can be pretty depressing. Actually. Don't put question marks on everything. <laughs> if it, but then we just have to agree that the unmarked doesn't mean it's actually unmarked. It means we don't know. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Okay. And I think that's quite a good default. Yeah. Because, yeah at least it would that would work for some people. I'm speaking about myself and one language. So. <laughs>
How, how very chin to speak and let your language be the default for everybody else. <laughs> you set the rules for following. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is a pretty standard. We use a dash for an affix. We use an equal sign for, for an enclitic. Um, but we do have some things that are sort of hanging out there. Oh, here's something interesting, though, uh, which is not, this is orthogonal parallel, but which is that um, we have a difference of analysis here where, uh, like, uh, Pavel <coughs> analyzes these very close constructions in Lamkang and, and uh, Anilnaga, where he has uh, the neg as a, um, as a bound morpheme, and I've analyzed it as a as an auxiliary, and so there. I think there's some room there for some discussion on uh, where are the things that have a status as auxiliaries. How do we decide that they are? What are the kinds of things that so, so that we have this kind of standardized idea? I hate <coughs> using the word standardized. It's more really throwing out the data and saying what are your arguments for making this a an auxiliary? How come it's different from what I've got? What were the changes that caused that? Because they're so close, geographically yeah. and yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's just making sure that you do it in a transparent way so that yeah. people can recover your, have a good mm -hmm. chance of recovering your intentions yes. and your decision making. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And for me, the, the thing was that after the root, you can get inflection, you can get plural marking. And so it, it seemed like a logical break because each of these things, the negative, neg negator and the root um, be, were behaving as if they were able to take uh, inflection and so there seemed like there was a, a, a break there morphologically made the description much easier and having inflection and derivation inter, interweaved um, but then in the again sort of uh, I would say you know legacy materials as well as some more modern things we have these things that are hanging out that have no dedicated structural kind of assignment and so there are these particle type things that maybe they're meant to be particles maybe they're not meant to be particles but they certainly look like it from the IGT and I would like to know I have an inquiring mind I would like to know what are they are they or aren't they and so um, there's one here uh, there's this one here that's actually um, uh, van Ken Van Vick actually calls this the, a verbal particle and these nominal particles, um, and that would be fine. We just want to know what that qualifies. How do you qualify for that? And that means whatever Ken thinks, uh, Matisoff thinks a uh, particle is. <laughs> so there are, okay, so we're going to find out what Matisoff thinks the particle is and, and give it a, so the, because it, ma it makes a huge difference computationally whether there's white space or no white space. And so to us it may be, well, I understand what this is, it's a particle. But if I hand it to a machine, it wants to know if there's no dash, does it something different? If there's an equal sign, it's something different. And if there's white space, it's something different. So we want to know what that value is and how we're supposed to be treating it if compared to another language, a related language. So, um, OK. Person indexation, we already saw this. This is my person indexation. The way I do it is totally controlled by flex because in flex you do, uh, it says like, it says S colon third. So it's a, so you still use a subject and object. It doesn't use agent and patient. And a lot of us don't use flex. So yeah. we, or we manually enter it in flex. I use the automatic. I call something um, inflectional. As soon as I call it that, it pulls up a menu and then I can select from it the different combinations, and then it gives me a templatic uh, assignment for that morphing. So I'm controlled by that, others are not, and uh, so if we want to be able to compare across our corpora, we would want to discuss, like, so what do you think the best way is to do this? And we just all do it. I think this is a very simple fix. It's just a discussion fix, and because all the languages are basically doing the indexation so in very similar ways. Uh, forces you to think about things in terms of subject and object rather than if you want to possible yeah. parameters. If you so want, you yeah, if you want to. Oh, uh, okay. But you can you can think outside of the predefined. Yeah, you can yeah. 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 You don't have to, but yeah. you yeah. could. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> I find one. Of the, I mean, I'll say that for discussion okay. at the end later. <laughs> um, so here's in die uh, subject agreement. First singular, I guess. Is that what AGR? I think that's what it means. 
Um, here's Tadao, uh, where we have two equal sign ergative, with well, the equal being that the ergative is, is a clitic. And um, then here, it's kind of an odd thing here in this suffix part of it, or oh, the prefix part of it with an equals here, I guess saying that this is not a prefix, but an inflict, or maybe it's a, yeah. I don't know if that was done on purpose. Or not. Okay, so that was one part. Finally, I think subordinate clauses. So in subordinate clauses, again, we have a large range, and I think we can simplify, and we can really do a better job here. Uh, we have uh, some that are these particle type. Um, we have some where we're actually defining the semantics of it, we'll say it means while. Um, and this is again the meso, so it's kind of, let's go to a more modern. Uh, here, and, and then in the lie one, in that handout, from the handout again, we've got, again, a description of exactly what it means, which is after. It doesn't tell you the category. But in the Dai Chin, it has this interesting thing of having subordinate colon and then giving us, so it has the, the, the super category and then the actual definition, which may be a useful way of like our comparing. Uh, if I just wanted to compare between Monsang, Anal, and Long Kang, if everything was marked as subordinator, that would make it much easier for me to pull them all out rather than just looking for where it said while. Um, in Hiao, this was really, uh, I just wanted to stop and talk about this example. I know this was sort of an example that's not exactly from IGT, but this particular type of thing like the bracketing, we think in these terms while we're creating our IGT, but we can't save it anywhere. So one of the things that I would, and I actually went to SIL and talked to folks there. And I was advocating for including in Flex several additional lines of annotation where I could actually go in and put in things like thematic role. I'd like to put in things like what is the, um, the discourse value of this particular NP? Like, is it previous mention? Is it, you know, old mention, new mention? Because all of that has implications for the kind of marking, or is it going to be zero, or what have you. But again, our software currently restricts us from recapturing or capturing the kind of information we're processing while we're doing our, our IGT. And so uh, it is, I think it's, there's a you know, huge room for improvement there. But that's what you've done here, is that you've gone and put in brackets, which is very useful for somebody trying to understand. And also very useful for a machine that's going in and trying to look at where, what is the non-phrase structure like for South Central and, and so on. But right now you can't really do that. You'd have to give it a lot of extra information because we have so many NPs that are missing as well. Mm -hmm. And so you know, being able to put that in our glossing would be great. Um, so here it, we have, again, this is you know, actually just giving us the, the semantics rather than the category. Um, and okay, so that was for that. Um, and this is actually going to a completely different topic, which is the derivational morphology. And I haven't dealt with this enough, I think, but we all know that there's this zone in our verb right after the stem and before the inflection where there are a bunch of different derivational morphemes that can occur. And they look similar, and, and, I, and I don't know, David, did you ever catalog a, a number of those derivational morphemes? I've seen a list of them somewhere, and so it would be nice to like maybe do a huge old spreadsheet with some of these meanings and the actual morphemes and see which languages they show up in, and could we in some way standardize some of these terms that we use to talk about those derivational morphemes? Maybe we can, maybe we can't, I don't know. I don't think we've, we've tried yet, and it's possible. Um, so, I think I've discussed white spaces somewhat, so the way we write things is really important and I think, um, uh, Zachary, you've done a really great job in your thesis where you've got the top line is, it is I think, the writing system, the second line is the IPA with the dashes in there. Uh, so we can ignore the orthographic line when we're doing our computational work. We can go to the second line, so if we could kind of agree to do something of that sort, or if we could ha be cognizant of the fact that working off of orthography is very confusing for somebody who's trying to use the spaces between the words to define this as a unit and to tell a Python script this is a unit when actually that's not the unit, but this is the unit. You know, so the writing systems that we use are all buried in the way that things are lumped together or separated, and so we, we our IGT should preferably go through something other than, than those, or should include something other than that. 
this seems to be a combination of, you know, because we've got an equal sign here, but then um, this guy here is sitting on by itself. All right. Um, I won't do anything with that, but just have one example of that. I'm not sure how many of you have examples of this sort, but for serialization, they have a, a dash and yeah, sure. Okay, so um, I'm going to wrap up now uh, because I wanted to just point out a couple of things while um, finishing up. This has been tried before for doing standardizing. So all that we've looked at right now really has to do with assigning structure to the morphology, dash, equal sign, space, and then we looked a little bit at glossing conventions. But there has been a whole movement for glossing conventions, this general ontology for linguistic description um, that uh, was funded by the National Science Foundation and is now defunct. The last kind of update was done in 2011 where there was kind of a, um, a forum where you could go in and say, oh, G gold ontology for linguistics description community, you have a list of all of the different ways that people can gloss um, words, but I found a new morpheme and you don't have that. So this person, for example, Christian uh, uh, says, I found something that I would like to call the pre-inventive case for, this, for Etruscan, and here are the uses of that, and please add that to your list of, of what's available. So what I'm saying is, what I'm, what I'm advocating for is a gold, but a gold for our, our community. Like what is the gold ontology for uh, South Central description? And we can have variation, but we would have a kind of a code book for people who wanted to do their glossing and who were just starting out. Those of us who have been glossing for a while maybe are reluctant, like I do it this way, I'm gonna keep doing it this way. But what I'd like to keep in mind is that, um, uh, well, Here's what I'd like to keep in mind. I'll come back to the, some of the other things in just a second. So what I'd like to keep in mind is this third point right here, is responsive methodology, which is the fact that, um, as those of you who've gone to Niels know, there are so many native speaking linguists that are now wanting to work on their languages. And in India, the, the way that people have been doing grammars has been sort of using, you know, these templates that come out of the Central Institute of Indian Languages and it would be really nice to encourage them to do more interlinear gloss text so that they're very challenged to get at the genius of the, of the languages that they're working on rather than copying you know, languages that already exist and saying, well, I found the seven cases in the language or whatever it is that they, they might do. And so if they're given a template for how to do that, if they're given a code book for how to do that, this would make it easier for them, it would make it more more kind of um, accessible, and it would be a kind of typological instruction as well. You may find verb serialization, you may find uh, verb stem alternation, you may find you know, these different kinds of grammatical categories that we've discussed exist, but with IGT and a guide to that, that would make it possible. Also, more and more the technologies for cross-corporate comparison and intra corporate comparison are becoming available. And so if we can be more systematic in the way we do this, then I could compare with Kumi and Miso and Lai, and for the next language that I work on, I could do a much faster analysis, because I could see how, say, Hyao and Kumi and Lumkang all work with, with respect to pre-verbal directionals. And then I could write a script that would tell my, tell my, uh, you know, my the process that I'm going through. That hey, here's a corpus of unanalyzed text. Here are all the verbs. Everything before the stem is open game for looking for directionals and go look for it. And so if we've analyzed things pretty much the same way, then that makes that writing of that script much easier. Um, so. This is what we're, we're looking at now, is that my Meite IGT and my Lamkan IGT are way off because I did them at very different stages. And so they've been a great playground for my, my, uh, my colleagues to look at and say, if we could do some kind of uh, standardizing between them, it would make, make for much faster, uh, faster use. All right. So let's look at these quotes and then we will finish up with that. So this is from Benjamin. After language transcription and annotation, the data formats and annotation standards vary widely, and this hinders data mining and hypothesis testing. 
So data formats, we're now all going into XML, so that's great. But we can go even further in making our XML look more like each other's XML because that would then um, make this, pro this new process of, of data mining that's happening. Um, I think not, not a pie in the sky dream, but something that we could really apply and do more historical work and all the kinds of works that we wanted to do faster. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.